The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash UQE. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, I'm Dr. John Anderson, and I practice internal medicine and diabetes at the Frist Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, we're going to talk about realizing your patient's potential, embracing the guidelines to appropriately individualize care for patients with type 2 diabetes. The first thing I want to do today is introduce a new patient to my office, Jim. He's 52 years old. He was referred to the office after his primary care physician retired. He's had a four-year history of type 2 diabetes, initially treated with just metformin, but he's really struggled with lifestyle changes, and he's seen a worsening of his glycemic control as he has gained weight. And so he presents for his first visit. He expresses this frustration with his inability to lose weight and the need for possibly more medication. And then he gives you this little caveat that he admits that he canceled his last office visit with his previous provider because the initiation of insulin had been discussed. And he feels like his diabetes has become more serious and he dreads the idea of giving himself an injection every day. Uh, he's a divorced father of two. He works in an auto parts store. His exercise activity is pretty limited. You know, he occasionally walks, but admits, you know, cold weather, hmm, not so much. His father died at 67 of an MI. His mother's alive and well at age 78. He's a sister who's alive and well, but his brother also has type 2 diabetes and just had a history of coronary artery stenting. So you got heart disease in both the father and the brother. He's got hypertension like most of our patients. He's got dyslipidemia. He is complaining about osteoarthritis of the knees. Of course, he's had type 2 diabetes. And if we look at his physical examination, he's 5'10". He weighs 223 pounds or a little over 100 kilos. His BMI is 32 which is, you know, typically in that obese range. Blood pressure, you can see there, is controlled. His pulse is 84. And on physical exam, the only thing you really see is some spurring on the left knee, and that's the worst knee that has the arthritis in it. And if you look at his laboratory results, his A1C is 8.3%. His fasting glucose, a little way from target on the 160 range. LDL cholesterol at target with 92. HDL 41. Triglycerides a little elevated. But he's got normal renal function, as you can see there by his BUN and creatinine. Current medications, like a lot of the patients that we will see, metformin, first drug of choice, he's maxed out at 2,000 milligrams a day on metformin. He's taking 4 milligrams a day of glimepiride. He's on an ACE inhibitor at maximum dose. He's on amlodipine. He's on atorvastatin. And he's also taking meloxicam because of this arthritis of the knees. And so one of the things we talked today about, Jim comes to see you. How do you start to make a decision about Jim? Where do you go first? Well, the first thing you do is you assess the key patient characteristics, right? We just talked about kind of where he is, what he does, what his fears and his concerns are. And we want to consider factors that may impact the choice of treatment. So, you know, his arthritis may be a factor. The fact he's got a family history of cardiac disease. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And we're now talking about both the ADA and the EASD, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, is talking about shared decision making. That means the patient has to participate in this decision making. So what we found is that adherence improves when the patient is buying into whatever management plan you both agree on. You agree on a management plan and then, of course, whose job is it to implement it? It's Jim. He's the one who lives with this disease every day. He is the one who owns the diabetes. We want to provide the resources. We want to give them the coaching. We want to give them our expertise. But we have to have Jim, along with his care team, implement the management plan. And then we have to give the ongoing monitoring and the support that he needs. Does he need to call back to my nurses? Uh, if I've started a new medication, maybe I don't want to see him in three to four months. Maybe I want a touch point in four weeks. Maybe that's an email. Maybe that's a phone call. But we have to assess how he's doing in between the time that he is in our office. And so we always, when he comes back, we review and agree on the management plan. How's he done? Is this the way we wanted it to work out? And of course, our goals of care, the center of everything is Jim, right? He is the center of all the decision making. And we really want to not only prevent complications, but we want Jim to not just live with diabetes. We want Jim to thrive with diabetes. And so this is a tool that you can get from the American Diabetes Association website. That's www.diabetes.org. It's an assessing patient characteristic tool talking about key components of the comprehensive diabetes medical evaluation. And it looks a little unwieldy when you first look at it because it looks like a long list, but most of this stuff is very, very intuitive. What's his medical history? What are the lifestyle factors? You know, medications, is he up to down on vaccinations? Particularly if he's over 65 or he has diabetes, he may need pneumonia vaccines. 
you know, what kind of self-management skills has he have? Has he been to diabetes education? Does he understand what is expected of him in this disease? Does he understand, you know, why we're working so hard to prevent future complications, both micro and macrovascular? And then you'll want to know physical exam and laboratory evaluation and what's his capability technology-wise. And this is really important when we're talking about patients who may be on basal bolus insulin therapy for whom, you know, sensors and other monitoring devices may enhance his ability to take care of himself. I want to mention that the American Diabetes Association has the 2019 Standards of Care app that you can download for free on the App Store and you can download it on Google Play on an Android device. Now, there's a lot of material there. There's a lot. The primary care team at the American Diabetes Association, uh, part of the diabetes' primary folks, have now taken the standards of care and they have distilled it down for just the real basics for a primary care provider and a primary care team. And I would encourage you to look for that online as well. So if we wanted to induce type 2 diabetes, and they've done this in laboratory rodents time after time over the years, what do you do? Well, you start the road genetically predisposed to developing diabetes, right? You give it unlimited access to high-fat food. You give it sweetened beverages to drink, not water. You limit the amount of physical activity it can get. You prevent it from getting enough sleep, and you stress it. This rodent, this rat's going to get diabetes. So how many of our patients actually look like that? I mean, how many of your patients, when you sit and talk to them, look like the patient who's working too hard, not getting enough sleep, eating poorly, and not exercising? So every time we see a patient, before we even discuss medications, you've got to talk about lifestyle modification. You know, what are the food choices? When I'm sitting down with a person like Jim, I'm talking about portion sizes. You know, a lot of our patients with type 2 diabetes really lack satiety cues. And so sometimes you have to talk about what is a portion size? What is a normal portion size? Uh, the other thing we talk about is don't drink your calories. And I have this conversation with my patients all the time. Okay, let's go through it. Alcohol, Gatorade, juices. You've got to be really specific. You've got to talk about sugar, sweetened beverages and how you eliminate that. And I have the conversation all the time. They go, oh, I can't stand diet drinks. Oh, I don't like water. Well, you know what? You're going to have to figure out something other than what you've been doing. And of course, if we can get our patients to shop twice a week at the grocery store or wherever they get their meals and cook at home, you know, you can control portion sizes. You can control fat content. You can control a lot of things you can at a restaurant. And we also talk about this plate where you want to put about 50% fruit and vegetables on one section of the plate, and maybe 25% protein and 25% grains. That means the macaroni and cheese can't pour over the side of the plate. And one of the things we always talk to our patients about is any physical activity that is incrementally more than what you were doing before is where you start. So if you're only going to the mailbox once a day, but you now go to the mailbox twice a day, it's a start. Ideally, you know, the ADA talks about walking at least 30 minutes five times a week. They also talk about resistance training. We also know that there are patients who have challenges that maybe there's not a safe place to walk or it's winter time and my patients hibernate for four months waiting for the good weather. I always talk to them about you got to have some place inside. You got to have a place you can go in inclement weather unless you're living somewhere whether it's all where it's always nice out. Um, and you've got to have something you enjoy doing, right? So if you hate the exercise, you're not going to do it. That's just human nature. The other part of this is it's got to be convenient. So if you say I love to swim, well the pool's 12 miles away. That's not going to be something you're going to do regularly. And then the other part of this, and this is sometimes a challenge for those of us with busy schedules, is get in bed. Get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And we know from studies that if you work routinely more than 55 hours a week, it actually increases your risk of type 2 diabetes and stroke. So all of those things are important. The other thing that we might want to talk to Jim about specifically is the challenge of osteoarthritis and type 2 diabetes. You know, we talked about uh, exercise and physical activity. Well, we know that some of our elderly patients and patients with advanced arthritis, you know, you may have to modify how you think about physical activity. And we know that patients with type 2 diabetes, that arthritis affects about 30% of our patients and that type 2 diabetes itself can accelerate cartilage damage. We also know that poor glycemic control can worsen cartilage damage in osteoarthritis. And then there are some medicines, particularly TZDs, that may increase fracture risk. And we actually think that metformin and insulin can improve fracture risk and bone health. It's also important that if you have patients with certain challenges, such as Jim with arthritis of the knees, that the physical activity and physical therapy and even internet delivered educational activities can reduce pain in patients with knee arthritis. And you may want to do something as specific as write Jim an exercise prescription. The comprehensive assessment of a patient like Jim 
is an essential component. And so one of the new things, and we'll talk about this with the guidelines, is that heart disease, heart failure history is a predominant theme in the new ADA EASD 2019 guidelines. We want to not only know what their glycemic lowering needs need to be, but we also want to know, do they have a history of heart disease? Do they have a history of heart failure? And we want to assess their overall risk for cardiovascular disease since it is still the leading killer of our patients with type 2 diabetes. The other thing we want to do is we want to stage their kidney disease. Do they have any CKD? Because if they do, that's going to push you in terms of a consideration of what medication class you may want to choose. We want to talk about hypoglycemia risk. When I sit down with Jim, you know, I say, okay, what's our glycemic goal? For Jim, it's certainly going to be less than 7%, right? And he's up in the eights, not at goal. We want to talk about hypertension goals. We want to establish blood pressure targets. We want to talk about diabetes self-management. How often do you want him to monitor? You know, some of our patients who are doing really well don't have to monitor often. If we have patients on a more complex regimen, you may need to monitor more often. You want to talk about how do you do that and how do you make decisions based upon that? And then you want to talk about lifestyle management. We talked a little bit about diet. We'll talk about what medications we're going to give him. We'll talk about the use of the glucose monitoring. And you know what? Here's the thing. When I started practice, you know, me, doctor, I'm the provider. I can do all of this. And now here in 2019, it's like, no. We understand there are things we do well. There are members of the team who do things better. So be free, especially with a new diagnosis of diabetes, to refer patients to a diabetes educator, to a nutritionist, a dietitian, and any other medical specialist that can help us with this patient. The other thing is I talked about shared decision making. This is a little uh, mnemonic you can keep with you, and it's talking about S, seek your patient's participation. H, help your patient explore and compare treatment options. A, assess your patient's values and preferences. R, reach a decision with your patient. And then as always, once you've made a decision, E, evaluate your patient's decision along the path. In 2012, the new guidelines for ADA and EASD came out, and they really sort of solidified what those of us in primary care have been talking about all along, which is we know we have glycemic goals, but we also know we have real patients. And not every goal is the same for every patient. The patients who are younger, healthier, with less comorbidities, more management skills, more, more support, no established cardiovascular disease. You know, we may want to be aggressive, and the guidelines say maybe as close to normal as possible. My 80-year-old on a walker, the person who has advanced cardiovascular disease, the person who's had a long duration of diabetes, the one who may have a shorter life expectancy. You know, the primary goal may be safety. Maybe it's avoidance of hypoglycemia. Maybe it's preventing falls. So every patient's different, and you need to have that conversation with your patient. And I even tell providers, you probably ought to document it in your uh, medical record. What are you trying to achieve with this particular patient? And then decision points, and these are the new guidelines from 2019 that say, based upon individual needs and clinical situation, we still talk about first-line therapy, as I talked about with Jim. Diet, exercise, lifestyle management, really hard for people to make changes, but not impossible. And then metformin, generally the first agent, but after metformin, what are we going to do? Are we going to be dealing with someone who has cardiac disease, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease? Is this someone who has a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia like I just described? Is this someone who really wants and needs the weight loss component of a class of agents? Or is this someone for whom cost is going to be the driving force behind any decision we make? We have a lot of patients that we make decisions based upon cost. So we're starting to talk about agents that are preferred especially for patients with heart disease, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease, we're really moving now to the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors. We know that the GLP-1 receptor agonists have the highest efficacy. Time after time, they have the greatest A1C lowering, which is why ACE, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, has as the second recommended class of agents, GLP-1 receptor agonists, just above the SGLT2s because of their intermediate efficacy in terms of glycemic lowering. We also know that both these classes of agents tend to not cause hypoglycemia, unless, of course, you're using them with a secretagogue or you're using them with insulin. Now, neither of these classes of drugs is indicated for weight reduction, but they both will have patients, in general, lose some weight, and I'll look at that data in a minute. GLP-1 receptor agonists, an injectable, SGLT2s, oral agents, and then costs are going to be high because they're newer agents. There is no generic, but I will say this, at least for commercial patients, and even more so 
with our Medicare population and Medicare Advantage plans. Most of these plans have at least one GLP-1 or one SGLT-2 inhibitor that's covered on their plans. So while they not be, may not be the least expensive, they're still available at reasonable prices. So GLP-1s, I talked about being prioritized as the first injectable agent. This is new in 2019, and it's from the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. And it basically says, no questions asked. In almost all cases after oral agents, the first injectable agent in type 2 diabetes ought to be a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Why? Because of efficacy, because of weight reduction, because of non-causing uh, hypoglycemia because of what we're gonna talk about in terms of cardiovascular benefits in some of these agents in the class. And the other thing is that if you look at the traditional use of basal insulin, you know, there's a little more that goes on when you do basal insulin. And if you look at all the head-to-head -head trials of the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist, that includes once a day and once a week, in general, added on to oral agents, the once a week and long-acting once a day GLP-1 receptor agonists have better efficacy lowering than even basal insulin products trying to titrate to fasting glucoses of less than 100. And so what happens when your patient says, you know, I'm really hesitant about doing an injection. Jim said that when he first came in. So when I'm going to talk to Jim, I'm going to ask him, what's the concern? Is it the concern that the injectable is insulin? Is it a concern that you think now your diabetes is more serious? Is it the needle? Because most people think it's the same size needle that you get blood drawn with, you know, a 20 gauge needle. They have no idea what a 32 gauge ultra fine needle looks like. And I have had several patients where we have just done practice sticking the abdomen and they go, is that all there is? So I encourage you, if you have a patient who's putting their hands up, address it. And these are subcutaneous, they're not intramuscular, so it's not like a testosterone injection. Most of these GLP-1 receptor agonist pens, they're all pre-filled, so there's not a lot of mixing or, or, or anything else that goes on with them. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, there was this myth that they caused pancreatic cancer. That came up in 2013. That has been largely debunked. And as I'm going to talk about in just a minute, some of these GLP-1 receptor agonists not only have glycemic efficacy, they actually have the ability to lower your risk for cardiovascular disease. And most of these GLP-1 receptor agonists can be taken at any time of the day. Here's the other problem about basal insulin. When you start to inject with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, you're not going to cause hypoglycemia. You're going to have weight loss instead of weight gain. You know, you're not going to have to monitor nearly as often. Some of these you don't even need to write a pen needle for. And while there is less hypoglycemia, you're going to have to talk to your patients with GLP-1 receptor agonists about nausea. And you can use the GLP-1 receptor agonist with just about any other oral agent, and they're very, very potent. Perhaps you're starting a GLP-1 in somebody who's already on a sulfonylurea or a secretagogue or insulin. You know, the question is always, what do I need to do with the sulfonylurea or the basal insulin? Well, it kind of depends, right? Your patient's got a fasting glucose like Jim that's up in the 160 range. He's kind of far away from his goal. You may just want to leave it on board. He's on glimepiride at 4 milligrams. You may think about cutting it in half. You may think about stopping it. But what you need to do is if he does have hypoglycemia for the very first time, he needs to understand it's the other agent. It's the sulfonylurea or the insulin. It's not the GLP-1 that you're starting. You also have to look at kidney function and hepatic function. Get longer duration of diabetes is going to be an influencing agent on hypoglycemia. You know, so if you have impaired kidney or hepatic function, something like a sulfonylurea may stick around for a long time. Insulin may stick around for a long time. If they're older and they're more frail, they're certainly going to be at more at risk for hypoglycemia and more risk of things like falls from hypoglycemia, more risk of cognitive impairment. Um, and cognitive impairment with age is also an independent risk factor for hypoglycemia. And we have some patients who have hypoglycemia unawareness. Fortunately, that tends to occur late in diabetes. It's not something that's real common early in diabetes. Alcohol use. Alcohol, most patients don't realize, can potentiate hypoglycemia, even after a meal and even several hours later. So you have to have that discussion with your patient. And of course, patients on multiple medicines who have polypharmacy, they may affect hypoglycemia. So when I'm talking to patients about hypoglycemia, I want to know when it occurred. I want to know what they ate that day. What were the circumstances? How did you recognize it? Tell me about your symptoms. Um, did you check your glucose? And how did you treat the hypoglycemia? No, it's not a Snickers bar. It's, you know, four to six ounces of a rapidly absorbed carbohydrate like juice or sugared beverages or two to three glucose tablets. And then I always talk to my patients about hypoglycemia and driving. 
because you, if you're driving 70 miles an hour or more on an interstate in a rural area, you may be seven minutes from your next exit. You need to have glucose tablets right here on the console. No, not in the purse where you have to reach over and fumble through a purse to find the glucose tablets. So it's all about having patients prepare. Some of the newer sensors, it makes it a little more easy to check before they drive. And so if that's important, maybe that's something your patient can, can purchase and buy. And then what, at what level does this patient actually perceive hypoglycemia? Because if you're getting patients who are getting well below 50 before they recognize it, then you may have to adjust your glycemic goals up a little bit. So what about weight benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors? And across the class, you can see here about canagliflozin, empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and ertugliflozin, which are the four agents available in the United States. All of these are associated with a two, two and a half kilo weight loss, so they're gonna lose five to six, maybe seven pounds. Again, not indicated for weight loss, but what a great non-glycemic benefit for a class of medications. GLP-1 receptor agonists, perhaps maybe just a little bit more, somewhere upwards of three, to four kilos. And it does seem that semaglutide, which is the latest GLP-1 receptor agonist once a week in the market, has, at least in the studies in the phase three clinical trials, the most weight loss. And people debate, is that a central nervous system effect? Is that a gastric emptying effect? Still yet to be determined. So in 2008, the FDA determined that all new drugs for type two diabetes, because of concerns about rosiglitazone and some other things, had to be mandated cardiovascular outcomes trials to prove safety. And so you can see listed here all of the ones that have thus been completed in the GLP-1 receptor agonist class. Elixir trial was a very brief trial, patients just having had an acute coronary event, only two years, and that was with lixazenatide. That's now in the United States in a co-formulation. It was prominent in Europe at the time. Liraglutide, which is the leader trial, which was a large number of patients, most of whom had cardiovascular disease. Sustain 6, a very short trial with semaglutide, um, and again, a large trial looking at all these uh, three-point maces that I'll get to in a minute. Excel, which reported last year, and then Harmony, that just reported outcomes in Berlin in October. All of these trials had as their primary endpoint three-point mace, major adverse cardiovascular events, and that is non-fatal MI, a non-fatal stroke, and cardiovascular death. And so, and all of these patients had a mixed degree of how much primary prevention, people who were just at high risk, and how much secondary prevention where they had a cardiovascular or peripheral vascular event. And so it's really important to look at these trials individually and not judge them, you know, in one big lump. I will also mention that Rewind has just completed and announced a positive result, and we're going to hear about that in San Francisco in June at the ADA scientific sessions. So what did these studies show? Well, different trials, different outcomes. The Elixir trial showed that lixazenatide was safe. It really wasn't powered to show benefit. Liraglutide with the leader trial was the first to show an improvement in three-point MACE, a 13% reduction, as well as a little bit of a reduction in the progression of renal disease during that. Semaglutide, again, a positive result, mainly driven by non-fatal stroke, but not enough for the FDA to give an indication because the numbers were small and it was a short trial. Exenatide ER just missing positivity with a p-value of, uh, of 0 0.06 versus 0 0.05. So again, trial design may have influenced this. And of course, the Rewind trial that all we know is that it shows positive results for superiority. We have nothing that we know about that other than that, except for the fact that it is a trial that has the most primary prevention and the patients with the best controlled A1C to date. So it'll be interesting to see. We also know the SGLT2 class with Empagliflozin was the first to report at Empareg in 2015. The CANVAS trial reported a positive three-point MACE result. And what we also see with the SGLT2 class that we don't see with the GLP-1 receptor agonist class is that all three of these agents, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin, seem to have a heart failure benefit. Dapagliflozin just reported their DECLARE trial, and they turned out neutral in terms of the three-point MACE. I also want to point out that when we look at large data sets in these real-world trials, we're seeing this heart failure benefit even in the real world and in non-randomized trial settings. Ertugliflozin, their cardiovascular outcome trial has not reported yet, but most of us think this is going to be a class effect. And when we look at real world data across hundreds of thousands of patients, this decrease in hospitalization for heart failure seems to hold true.
There are some dosing considerations. The exenatide and lixazenatide molecules are small. They are renally excreted, so you really don't want to use those in patients with CKD4. And you want to make sure their GFR is well above 30. I would even recommend maybe over 45. We also know that with the GLP-1 receptor agonist class that acute kidney injury, you know, anytime these patients have GI side effects and they have volume contraction um, and they can't control it, then anybody, even though it may not be a direct renal effect, their renal function can worsen. So be careful in your CKD patients who may be starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist. We also know that there are renal thresholds for the SGLT2 inhibitors. Each of them are a little bit different, but that's all based upon efficacy, really, and potentially side effects. If we see that these drugs, which are being studied down to GFRs of 30, have renal protection, you may see a very big difference uh, in the next couple of years in what the FDA recommends as those uh, levels for use. We know about the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists and thyroid C-cell tumors. Mostly we're seeing that in rodents. Again, you wouldn't use this in patients with a history of uh, MEN2 or a family history or a personal history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, the pancreatitis thing has been an association pretty much debunked. And then there are a lot of other additional considerations with volume and hypotension. Um, there was this issue about fracture risk, uh, very small numbers in the CANVAS trial. Um, and so, you know, each of these patients needs to have their care individualized. If we look at the SGLT2 inhibitors on the instance of progression of renal disease, we see that this is a 30 to 40 to 50 percent reduction in the progression, and that is things like doubling of creatinine, a time to renal replacement therapy, renal death. And so it's going to be really interesting in the next several years because all of these agents are being studied in renal trials, and I think that we may see the very first indication since ACEs and ARBs 22 to 3 years ago for renal protection in patients with type 2 diabetes on top of use of RAS inhibition. And then, of course, renal impairment with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, maybe not as profound, but there's still some benefits that we don't understand fully. But it looks like the SGLT2 inhibitor class is going to have some renal protection as we look at these cardiovascular outcomes trials. And Credence, which is a trial of canagliflozin in a large number of patients with CKD, was stopped a year early by the Data Safety Monitoring Board because it showed such a positive result in the progression of renal disease. So how do you determine this class? If I want to put Jim on an SGLT2 inhibitor, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which one? First of all, I'm going to have Jim help make the decision for me. Do you want a once a day? Do you want a once a week? Do you want to look at these devices? Which one seems the most easy for you? Which one do you think you'd like to do? But there are also formulary lookup tools. There are formulary search tools. You can look at retail pharmacies and pricing online. But sometimes I'll just tell my patient, look, here's the four in the class. Here's the four in the class or the ones that we're considering. Maybe there's two or three. Figure out which ones are covered. And I'll frequently get a call back that afternoon, either from the pharmacy or they've called their insurance company. And they'll, these two are covered. These two are covered. And we'll make a decision about what to start. So in summary, what are we going to do with Jim? Well, I would like to recommend a GLP-1 receptor agonist with him. The reason being is that it's got the most efficacy. It's going to help him most with that weight reduction he's so interested in. He's concerned that his diabetes get, is getting more serious. He avoided his last visit with his doctor because they started talking about insulin. Well, I think it's pretty clear from what we went through, and even though Jim doesn't have heart disease, still, the number one recommended class for him is going to be a GLP-1 receptor agonist as the first injectable before we consider starting basal insulin. And I would argue that at an A1C of 8.2, he's going to have more potency than he might with an SGLT2 inhibitor. He also has a strong family history of cardiac disease. And while none of these trials is about primary prevention, in the back of our minds, we're thinking maybe we can do something good for his cardiovascular prevention, even though we don't have a trial that will ever be designed specifically to follow someone for 20 to 30 years for primary prevention. But first, I want to get his fear. I mean, why the injection fear? Is it because it was insulin and he thought it was more serious? Is it the size of the needle pain? Is he not going to be able to do this well? And so showing devices, showing the size of the needle will really help that. I'll also have the consideration of, would you rather do a once a day? Would you rather do once a week? Invariably, most of my patients with new starts want to do a once a week. And there's also a little grace period in most of these agents because if you miss a day or two, you're still good for up to three days afterwards. Now, I've had a lot of patients who've enjoyed a once-a-day injection. They do well. I certainly would never take a patient off a successful once-a-day regimen if they're enjoying it and if it's doing what we want to achieve. 
So that's the discussion. But, you know, if Jim gives me some pushback and says, you know, Dr. Anderson, even with everything you're telling me, I hear you, I really would rather do the oral agent first, then that's what we're going to do. And I'd likely go with the SGLT2 inhibitor, again, to try to address that concern of weight reduction. If I do decide to use a GLP-1 receptor agonist, then I am going to talk to him about portion sizes when he eats and eating slower and paying attention to satiety cues that I think a lot of people with type 2 diabetes initially lack. And I also tell them that the nausea and the GI side effects are likely to be early in the course of therapy and usually wane quickly in the first two to three weeks. I'm also going to talk to Jim about diet and exercise. I mentioned that earlier. We may ask Jim if he wants to talk to somebody about his diet and refer him to a dietitian who can spend a lot more time with him than I can. We may want to talk to him about his knee. Is there something we can do to mitigate the pain and discomfort from his knee and maybe get him uh, a little more active before I see him back? The other thing I want to do with him is make sure he's buying into this and understand that there needs to be a touch point with him from either me or my staff, not three months when he shows back up to get his A1C done, but sometime in the next four weeks to say, hey, GI side effects, how are they doing? How are you handling the injection? Are there any other problems you're having? Is there anything that we can do to make you successful? And I will tell you, a one-minute phone call can go a long way with a patient when they're starting a new therapy. And it's important to get Jim's buy-in because reviewing shared decision-making and encouraging the patients to talk to us about what's important to them, as well as getting their acceptance, will improve adherence down the road. And so we want to try to look at our current guidelines, what's the clinical evidence, and then take all that information and apply it to the patient in the office with us. We want to maximize outcomes by meeting these individualized glycemic and non-glycemic goals. We want to talk about benefits and limitations of the currently available antihyperglycemic therapies, you know, talk about worsening of comorbidities, the risk for hypoglycemia, a lot of things I've already talked about. And then try to break down what are the common barriers, what is standing in the way to make Jim successful. And so I think with these kinds of tools and how we approach this, we're entering a new phase of diabetes management. We almost have a blessing of riches, right? So much of an expansion of the number of diabetes drugs in the last 20 years that it's almost dizzying to people who are not expert in this every single day. But if you learn how to use these agents in the class, and if you understand that the science is evolving in terms of renal and cardiac protection, we have a lot more to offer, Jim, than we did 20 years ago. So I want to thank you for participating in your attention today and for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash UQE. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. For further information concerning Lilly Grant Funding, visit www.lillygrantoffice.com. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education.